गुड मॉर्निंग सो सिंस लास्ट टू लेक्चर वी आर सीइंग अबाउट एड्स एड्स द एक्वायर्ड इम्यूनो डेफिशिएंसी सिंड्रोम आल्सो कॉल्ड एज स्लिम डिसीज इट इज अ फेटल इलनेस कॉज्ड बाय रेट्रोवायरस नोन एज ह्यूमन इम्यूनो डेफिशिएंसी वायरस we have seen this all these things meaning of hiv human that is it can live only in humans immunodeficiency means it damages the immune system of people it infects and it is a virus that is retrovirus rna virus and we have we had seen about mode of transmission that is sexual transmission blood contact maternal fetal transmission then also incubation period so incubation period is uncertain that is from few months to 10 years or even more then we had seen about types of aids so it is classified into four broad categories first is initial infection with the virus and development of antibodies second is asymptomatic carrier state third is aids related complex and last one is aids so initial infection in initial infection there is only mild illness like fever sore throat and rash or in some cases there is no symptoms for first 5 years they look healthy and feel well although right from start they can transmit the virus to others these hiv antibodies usually take between 2 to 12 weeks to appear in the blood stream though they have been known to take longer so the period before antibodies are produced is called as window period during which although the person is particularly infectious because of high concentration of virus in the blood he will test negative on the standard antibody blood test then second stage is asymptomatic carrier state these infected people have antibodies but no overt sign, signs of disease except persistent generalized lymphadenopathy and it is not clear how long the symptomatic carrier state last third is aids related complex a person with arc that is aids related complex has illness caused by the damage to the immune system but without opportunistic infections and cancers which are associated with aids they may have some clinical signs like unexplained diarrhea lasting longer than a month fatigue malaise loss of more than 10% body weight fever night sweats or other milder opportunistic infections such as oral thrush generalized lymphadenopathy or enlarged spleen last is aids so aids is the end stage of hiv infection a number of opportunistic infections commonly occur in this stage and of cancers that occur in people with otherwise unexplained defect in immunity and death is due to uncontrolled or untreatable infection then 
the common opportunistic infections are tuberculosis, persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, Kaposi sarcoma, oropharyngeal candidiasis, cytomegalovirus retinitis, pneumocystosis, carini pneumonia, toxoplasma encephalitis, hairy leukoplakia, cryptococcal meningitis, herpes zoster or shingles, severe pruralgo or pruralitic dermatitis, severe or recurrent skin infections. So these are last stage. Then today we'll see about HIV and its diagnosis. So, diagnosis of AIDS. First is clinical. So, WHO case definition for AIDS surveillance. So, for the purpose of AIDS surveillance, an adult or adolescent is considered to have AIDS if at least two of the major signs are present in combination with at least one of minor signs. And if these signs are not known, to be due to a condition which is unrelated to HIV infection. So this is the case definition by WHO for AIDS surveillance. That is, a person is having AIDS more than 12 years of age if at least two of major signs are present in combination with at least one of minor signs. And if these signs are not known to be due to condition which is not related to HIV infection. So major signs are weight loss, approximately 10% of body weight, chronic diarrhea for more than one month, prolonged fever for more than one month, which may be intermittent or constant, minor signs like persistent cough for more than one month, generalized prolytic dermatitis, history of herpes zoster, oropharyngeal candidiasis, chronic progressive or disseminated herpes simplex infection, and generalized lymphadenopathy. The presence of either generalized Kaposi sarcoma or cryptococcal meningitis is sufficient for the diagnosis of AIDS for surveillance purposes. The clinical case definition was developed to enable reporting of the number of people with AIDS for the purpose of public health surveillance rather than for patient care. However, for the purpose of individual case management, it is useful to be able to diagnose whether illnesses may be due to HIV infection, that is symptomatic HIV infection, because Clinical manifestations can be a reliable indicator of underlying HIV infection. Overuse of HIV testing is avoided. Testing is used to confirm suspected HIV infection rather than as a diagnostic tool in the first instance. A patient with suspected HIV infection can be counseled about having an HIV test the implications for them and their sexual partners, self-care and nutrition. So, counseling is very important. Many HIV-related illness can be treated, improving the patient's quality of life. Certain drugs like thiacetazone causes severe side effects in people with HIV infection and should not be prescribed for them. In children, the case definition of AIDS is fulfilled if 
at least two major signs and two minor signs are present. And if there is a no other known cause of immunosuppression. So major signs are weight loss or abnormally slow growth, chronic diarrhea for more than one month, prolonged fever for more than one month. Minor signs are generalized lymph node enlargement, oropharyngeal candidiasis, recurrent common infections, for example, ear infection, pharyngitis, persistent cough, generalized rash, and confirmed HIV infection in the mother counts as a minor criteria. Then expanded WHO case definition for AIDS surveillance is for the purpose of AIDS surveillance an adult or adolescent more than 12 years of age is considered to have AIDS if test for HIV antibodies gives positive result and one or more of the following conditions like 10% body weight loss or cachexia with diarrhea or fever or both intermittent or constant fever for at least one month. Cryptococcal meningitis, pulmonary or extrapulmonary tuberculosis, Kaposi sarcoma, neurological impairment that is sufficient to prevent, independent daily activities, not known to be due to conditions which are not related to HIV infection. For example, neurological impairment due to trauma, or cerebral vascular accident. Then candidiasis of esophagus, clinically diagnosed life threatening or recurrent episodes of pneumonia with or without etiological confirmation, invasive cervical cancer. Major features of this expanded surveillance case definitions are that it requires an HIV serological test and includes broader spectrum of clinical manifestation of HIV such as tuberculosis, neurological impairment, pneumonia and invasive cervical cancer. So this definition is simple to use and has higher specificity. Then next is clinical staging. So WHO has developed a clinical staging system originally for prognosis, which is based on clinical criteria. So clinical condition or performance score, whichever is higher, determines whether the patient is at clinical stage 1, 2, 3 or 4. And this clinical stage is important as a criteria for starting antiretroviral therapy. So WHO has developed a clinical staging system based on clinical criteria. So we can determine whether the patient is clinical stage 1, 2, 3 or 4. And depending on this, we can start antiretroviral therapy. So clinical stage 1. So this stage 1 is asymptomatic or having persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. Stage 1 is asymptomatic or having persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. Then stage 2, moderate Unexplained weight loss that is under 10% of presumed or measured body weight. Recurrent respiratory tract infections like sinusitis, tonsillitis, otitis media, pharyngitis. Third is herpes zoster, angular chilitis, recurrent oral ulcerations. Papular pruritic eruptions, seborrheic dermatitis, 
fungal nail infections. So in clinical stage two, here are symptoms like moderate unexplained weight loss, recurrent respiratory tract infections, herpes zoster, angular chilitis, recurrent oral ulcerations, papular pruritic eruptions, seborrheic dermatitis, and fungal nail infections. Then stage three. In stage three, unexplained severe weight loss that is over 10%. Unexplained chronic diarrhea for longer than one month. Unexplained persistent fever. It may be intermittent or constant for longer than one month. Persistent oral candidiasis. Oral hairy lipoplakia, pulmonary tuberculosis, severe bacterial infection, example pneumonia, empyema, meningitis, bone or joint infection, bacteremia, severe pelvic inflammatory diseases, acute necrotizing ulcerative stomatitis, gingivitis or periodontitis. Unexplained anemia, that is below 8 gram per DL. Neutropenia, below 0.5 into 10 raised to 9 per liter. Or chronic thrombocytopenia, 15 to 10 raised to 9. So in stage 3, there is an unexplained severe weight loss, that is over 10%. Unexplained chronic diarrhea for longer than 1 month. Unexplained persistent fever, persistent oral candidiasis, oral hairy leukoplakia, pulmonary tuberculosis, severe bacterial infections, acute necrotizing ulcerative stomatitis, gingivitis, or periodontitis, unexplained anemia, neutropenia. Chronic thrombocytopenia. Then stage 4. In stage 4, that is HIV wasting syndrome. That is severe weight loss. Pneumocystis pneumonia. Recurrent severe bacterial pneumonia. Chronic herpes simplex infection like orolabial, genital, or anorectal for more than one month's duration, esophageal candidiasis or candidiasis of trachea, bronchi, or lungs, extrapulmonary tuberculosis, Kaposi sarcoma, cytomegalovirus disease, like a retinitis or infection of other organs, excluding liver, spleen, and lymph nodes. Central nervous system toxoplasmosis and HIV encephalopathy. Clinical stage 4, it is HIV wasting syndrome, that is severe weight loss, pneumocystis pneumonia, recurrent severe bacterial pneumonia, Chronic herpes simplex infection, that is orolabial, genital, or anorectal for more than one month's duration. Esophageal candidiasis or candidiasis of trachea, bronchi, or lungs. Extrapulmonary tuberculosis, Kaposi sarcoma, cytomegalovirus disease, that is retinitis or infection of other organs. Excluding liver, spleen, and lymph nodes. Central nervous system toxoplasmosis. And HIV encephalopathy. Then clinical stage 4 also includes extrapulmonary cryptococcosis, including meningitis. 
disseminated non tuberculous my mycobacteria infection progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy disseminated mycosis that is histoplasmosis or coccidomycosis recurrent septicemia lymphoma it may be cerebral or b cell non hodgkins lymphoma then invasive cervical carcinoma or typical disseminated leishmaniasis symptomatic hiv associated nephropathy or hiv associated cardiomyopathy so stage 4 also includes extra pulmonary cryptococcus including meningitis disseminated non tuberculous mycobacterium infection progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy disseminated mycosis recurrent septicemia lymphoma invasive cervical carcinoma or typical disseminated leishmaniasis symptomatic hiv associated nephropathy or hiv associated cardiomyopathy then what is hiv wasting syndrome so hiv wasting syndrome is weight loss more than 10% of body weight plus either unexplained diarrhea for more than 1 month or chronic weakness and unexplained fever more than 1 month what is hiv wasting syndrome it is weight loss more than 10% of body weight plus either unexplained diarrhea for more than one month or chronic weakness and unexplained fever for more than one month. Then laboratory diagnosis. So first one is screening test. As antibodies to HIV are far easier to detect than the virus itself. So their presence or absence in the bloodstream is the basis for most widely used test for HIV infection. Screening test first is as antibodies to HIV are far easier to detect than the virus. So presence or absence of these antibodies in the bloodstream is the basis for most widely used test of HIV infection. A person whose blood contains HIV antibodies is said to be HIV positive or zero positive, meaning that he or she is infected with HIV. At present, to ensure accuracy, Two different tests are commonly applied. At first, a sensitive test is used to detect HIV antibodies. At first, a sensitive test is used to detect HIV antibodies, the first kind of test is normally called as ELISA. Enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. That is ELISA. While a second confirmatory test is used to weed out any false possi possible positive result. So a confirmatory test usually a Western blast test is a highly specific test and it is based on detecting specific antibody to viral core protein and enveloped glycoprotein called a GP41. So there are two different tests which are commonly applied. First one is ELISA 
which is sensitive test. And the second test is Western blot test, which is specific test. It is based on detecting specific antibodies to viral core protein that is P24 and enveloped glycoprotein that is GP41. The next is virus isolation. A test for the virus itself would eliminate the painful uncertainty of AIDS infection. So this HIV virus can be recovered from cultured lymphocytes. This type of testing is very expensive and requires extensive laboratory support. So virus isolation, this is a test for virus itself. HIV can be recovered from cultured lymphocytes, but this type of testing is very expensive and requires extensive laboratory support. Then there are some non-specific laboratory findings with HIV infection, which may include anemia, leukopenia, in that also particularly lymphocytopenia, and thrombocytopenia. So other associated laboratory findings are anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. Then also several laboratory markers are available to provide prognostic information and guide therapy decision. The most widely used marker is absolute CD4 lymphocyte count. As the count decreases, the risk of opportunistic infection increases. So the people with healthy immune system usually have more than 950 CD4 cells per mule of blood. And the people with AIDS usually have CD4 cell count below 200. So some several laboratory markers are available to provide prognostic information and guide therapy decision. And the most widely used marker is absolute CD4 lymphocyte count. As the count decreases, the risk of opportunistic infection increases. Normally, in healthy people, this CD4 count is more than 950 CD4 cells per mule of blood. But in people with AIDS, they usually have CD4 cell count below 200. So in short, laboratory findings with HIV infection. First is ELISA, that is HIV enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Its significance is it is screening test for HIV infection and its sensitivity is more than 99.9%. To avoid false positive results, repeatedly reactive results must be confirmed with Western blot. Second is Western blot. It is the confirmatory test for HIV. Its specificity when combined with ELISA is more than 99.99%. Indetermined result with early HIV infection. HIV-2 infection, autoimmune diseases, pregnancy, and recent tetanus toxide administration. Then CBC, CBC shows anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. All these are common with advanced HIV infection. Then absolute CD4 lymphocyte count. 
it is most widely used predictor of hiv it shows progression of disease risk of progression to an aids opportunistic infection or malignancy it is high with cd4 count less than 200 cells per million then cd4 lymphocyte percentage this percentage may be more reliable than cd4 count risk of progression to an aids opportunistic infection or malignancy is high with percentage less than 14% then hiv viral load test this test measure the amount of actively replicating hiv virus it correlates with disease progression and response to antiretroviral drugs then next is beta 2 microglobulin cell surface protein indicative of macrophages monocyte stimulation levels more than 3.5 mg per dl are associated with rapid progression of disease and it is not useful with intravenous drug users then p24 antigen it is indicative of active hiv replication
So these are the important tests which are done in HIV. The first one is ELISA, second Western blot, CBC, absolute CD4 lymphocyte count, CD4 lymphocyte percentage, HIV viral load test, beta 2 microglobulin, and P24 antigen. Prompt and precise diagnosis of AIDS make great impact on humanity. Then prevention. So there are four basic approaches to control AIDS. First is prevention, which includes education. And second one is prevention of blood-borne HIV transmission. Then second is antiretroviral treatment. Third is specific prophylaxis. And last is primary health care. The four basic approaches to control the AIDS. First is prevention. In prevention, there is education and prevention of blood-borne HIV transmission. Second is antiretroviral treatment, specific prophylaxis, and primary health care. So prevention in that education, until a vaccine or cure for AIDS is found, the only means at present available is health education to enable people to make life-saving choices. For example, avoiding indiscriminate sex using condoms. There is, however, no guarantee that the use of condom will give full protection. One should also avoid the use of shared razors and toothbrushes. Intravenous drug users should be informed that the sharing of needles and syringes involves special risk. So first is education. So health education is very important to enable people to make life-saving choices. One should also avoid use of shared razors and toothbrushes. Intravenous drug users should be informed that sharing of needles and syringes involves special risk. Women suffering from AIDS or who are at high risk of infection should avoid becoming pregnant since infection can be transmitted to the unborn or newborn. Then educational material and guidelines for the prevention should be made widely available. All mass media channels should be involved in educating the people on AIDS, its nature, transmission and prevention. This includes international travelers also. So stop AIDS, like follow single partner, safe sex, no narcotics, and regular testing. In prevention of blood-borne HIV transmission, people in high-risk groups should be urged to refrain from donating blood, body organs, sperm, or other tissues. All blood should be screened for HIV-1 and HIV-2 before transfusion. Transmission of infection to hemophiliacs can be reduced by introducing heat treatment of factors 8 and 9. 
strict sterilization practices should be ensured in hospital and clinics. Pre-sterilized disposable syringes and needles should be used as far as possible. One should avoid injections unless they are absolutely necessary. Then antiretroviral treatment. So at present, there is no vaccine or cure for the treatment of HIV infection or AIDS. However, the development of the drugs that suppresses the HIV infection itself rather than its complications has been important development. These antiviral chemotherapy have proved to be useful in prolonging the life of severely ill patients. In the availability of agents in combination suppresses HIV replication. So it has profound impact on natural history of HIV infection. So as we know, there is no vaccine or cure for the HIV infection. We have drugs, antiviral drugs, which only prolongs the life of severely ill patients. It suppresses HIV replication and it has effect on natural history of HIV infection. Then classification of drugs. The drugs used for ART are classified as nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor which include Abacavir, Didanosin, m tripacitabine Lamivudin, Stavudin, and Zidovudin. Second is nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It contains tenofovir. Third is Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, ifavirins, itravirin, and navirapin. The protease inhibitors like atazanavir plus ritonavir, darunavir plus ritonavir, fosamprenavir plus ritonavir, indinavir plus ritonavir, Lopinavit or Ritonavir, Sacvinavir plus Ritonavir, and integrase strand, strand transfer inhibitors that is Raltegravir. So these are names of some drugs. WHO recommended ARV treatment schedule. So WHO has been providing guidance on use of ARV drugs since 2002, producing a range of guidelines on various aspects of HIV diagnosis, treatment and care. The 2013 guidelines aim to combine and harmonize new and existing recommendations, including updated recommendations from the 2010 guidelines on ART for adults, adolescents, and children, and ARV treatment and prophylaxis for pregnant and breastfeeding women living with HIV. The new clinical recommendation in guidelines includes first is treating adults, adolescents, and older children earlier. It includes starting ART in all individuals with a CD4 cell count of 500 cells per mm cube or less, giving priority to individuals with severe or advanced HIV disease and those with CD4 cell count of 350 cells per mm cube or less, starting ART at any CD4 count for certain population with HIV, including people with active TB disease, like people with hepatitis B virus, co-infection, with severe chronic liver diseases, HIV-positive partners, in zero discordant couples, 
pregnant and breastfeeding woman, children younger than five years of age. A new preferred first line ART regimen harmonized for adults, pregnant, and breastfeeding women and children aged three years and older. The use of viral load testing as a preferred approach to monitoring the success of ART. Diagnosing treatment failure in addition to clinical and CD4 monitoring of people who are receiving ART. Then fifth is community-based HIV testing and counseling. HIV and testing of adolescents to diagnose people with HIV earlier and link them to the care and treatment. The next is post-exposure prophylaxis. PEP for HIV consists of comprehensive set of services to prevent infection developing in an exposed person, which includes first aid care, counseling and risk assessment, HIV testing and counseling, and depending on the risk assessment, the short-term provision of antiretroviral drugs with support and follow for 28 days. Then eligibility of post-exposure prophylaxis. Post-exposure prophylaxis should be offered and initiated as early as possible to all individuals with exposure that has potential for HIV transmission and ideally within 72 hours. Assessment for eligibility should be based on HIV status of source whenever possible and may include consideration of background prevalence and local epidemiological pattern. Exposure that may warrant post-exposure prophylactic include parenteral or mucous membrane exposure, that is sexual exposure, and splashes to the eye, nose, and oral cavity. Then following bodily fluids may pose a risk of HIV infection like blood, blood stained saliva, breast milk, genital secretions, cerebrospinal, amniotic, rectal, peritoneal, synovial, pericardial, or pleural fluids. An exposure that does not require post-exposure prophylaxis includes when exposed individual is already HIV positive, when the source established is to be HIV negative, and exposure to body, bodily fluids that does not pose significant risk like tears, non-blood stained saliva, urine and sweat. Assessment of HIV status of exposed individuals should not be barrier to initiating post-exposure prophylaxis. In emergency situation where HIV testing and counseling is not readily available but potential HIV risk is high or if the exposed person refuses initial testing, post-exposure prophylaxis should be initiated and HIV testing and counseling undertaken as soon as possible. Then monitoring efficacy of ART. Efficacy is monitored by clinical improvement, that is gain in body weight, decrease in occurrence and severity of HIV-related diseases, increase in total lymphocyte count, improvement in biological markers of HIV, that is CD4+, plus, T lymphocyte counts, plasma HIV, RNA levels. And specific profile axis. Until more effective antiretroviral therapy becomes available, main aim of existing therapies will be treat manifestation of AIDS. That is primary prophylaxis against the diseases or opportunistic infections. Primary health care. Because of wide-ranging health implication, AIDS touches all aspects of primary health care, including mother and child health, family planning and education. So it is important, therefore, that AIDS control programs are not developed in isolation. National AIDS Program, the WHO launched Global Program on AIDS on Feb 1, 1987 to provide global leadership and to support the development of 
national aids programs we celebrate world aids day on 1st december so thank you here we complete the aids if any doubt you can call me or message me personally thank you you can leave the meeting